Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today and welcome to 2024. Hope everybody had a very happy and healthy new year. Today is Tuesday, January 2nd. I am Frank Stanfield. Still no Scott White. None of the Chris's could be found. So instead, I figured I'd start the new year off with a bang. Joining us for the first time is a gentleman who we've cited many times on this podcast. If you're passionate about fantasy baseball and pitching, you probably already know who he is. Welcome to the show, Lance Brozdowski. Thanks so much for hopping on, man. Thanks for having me, man. This is a really cool moment. We were just talking off air about how I used to listen to this podcast and still do, but like listen to it intensely back in like 2016, 2017. It was one of the first fantasy baseball podcasts that I really ever listened to. So it's cool to actually be on it. Dude, you and me are in the same boat. Again, we were talking beforehand. This was the first podcast I listened to when I was back in college. And then the next thing you know, 10 years later, I'm hosting it. So it's like still kind of surreal for me at times. So I'm happy we could uh, do this together. And uh, look, I consider you one of the best baseball minds out there. Uh, you are that. the player development analyst at the Marquee Sports Network with the Chicago Cubs. I know that you have a sub stack. You have a YouTube channel. So just let everyone know where they can find all of your great work. Yeah, yeah. Primarily on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now. That's been the biggest following that I've grown has been on there. Recently started to realize that I needed to push into other mediums. So that's when I, I, I've had the YouTube going for a while, but this year I think I'm going to really try to kick it in gear and get some growth there. Um, a lot of the stuff that I post on YouTube is, is honestly me thinking through things and I'm just doing it on camera. So I, I hope it informs people. I know there's a lot of people that watch it and get a lot of value out of it. I started a sub stack earlier this year. Um, in 2023 that essentially every morning I wake up and I, I rip through pictures and what they changed. And again, it's, it's really like a thought process. I, I abide by that, that Rick Rubin idea of creating content that you like, you know, that you would want. So I, I, I just, I love digging into pictures. I love thinking about pitching. I love trying to figure out if I have an edge on a specific pitcher in a certain direction from the statistics side or any of the more advanced pitching stats that I imagine we're going to get into in this podcast. Yeah, and it's incredibly helpful for us, the fantasy players, because while you're trying to find that edge, you're also helping us find that edge. So the things that you look into, uh, you know, stuff plus and release points and grips and and spin rates and all this kind of crazy stuff, we'll talk about that here today on the podcast. Again, make sure to follow uh, Lance on Twitter. X again, I don't really know what we're doing <laughs> now either, but it's at Lance Braz. That's L-A-N-C-E. B R O Z. You're also a former video editor at driveline baseball. So I did want you to quickly tell me about that, what you did with them and how much fantasy players should actually pay attention to pitchers that go to driveline, because it feels like the past couple of years and even with hitters, because I know hitters are going out to driveline now as well. We're very pick and choosy, right? Like this pitcher went to driveline and they had a great year, but then we might not talk about the pitcher that went to driveline that like didn't have a great mm -hmm. year or didn't improve. Right? So how much should we pay attention to that? And, and what do you actually do with them? Yeah, Driveline was a, is a kind of an odd opportunity. I used to write a while back for the Hardball Times, just submitted some pieces and wrote some stuff. And I had a conversation in a clubhouse with Luke Jackson, the reliever from the Braves at the time. I think he's on the Giants now. I might even be a free agent. He's running some injuries, but he always had a funky slider. So I, I talked to him, had a really good conversation in, in the clubhouse. And then I ended up circling back with his throwing trainer there, who's now the assistant pitching coach with the angels, his name's Bill Hazel and Bill and I talked and I, it was one of those conversations that you have that you learn a lot in such that you really want to continue having conversations with that individual. It's just, everything clicked. We had good chemistry. He had a really good way of explaining things. And I started to really understand what gyro spin was around sliders. I, I don't even remember the year on this, but it probably was around 2018 or so. So I ended up writing the story and then I found out that driveline needed help with video editing. Essentially back in the day, they didn't really have anybody to stitch together a track man output rap Soto which are two pieces of technology that measure pitch movement and then edge track cameras, which are really slow motion, slow frame stuff you probably see on the driveline count all the time. So I was essentially a video editor who had stitched this stuff together. Their throwing trainers would be like, hey, we're working on getting this guy a different slider. Can you piece together pitch two and six as the bad ones to show him what he's doing with his wrist at release? And then let's do 10 and 12 are the ones that we actually want. Split screen then pause. So my video editing skills kind of turned into something that allowed me to capitalize on getting a lot of experience in that way. At the time, it was just cool to look at that stuff. Just cool to look at TrackMan outputs and, and kind of delve into that. And then I slowly realized that a lot of those throwing trainers I work with are now working for major league teams. So the true value in that job at the time was creating a network of people that I can now ask questions to and get smarter. So that's what I did, did with Driveline. And, you know, applying it to fantasy, I do play some fantasy. Um, 
I primarily play Rota. I don't really play too much points or anything, so I, I don't know if I'd be able to speak to that much. And most of my stuff is on NFBC. I do a lot there. A um, couple satellite leagues. I usually have a you know a reasonable amount of money down per season on that. And I think I've been positive. I, I'm very nerdy. I look at the stuff from an ROI perspective. But I think I'm positive ROI each of my, each of my last two years. I had a nice win in a satellite league last year that that helped me uh, cover my losses in some other leagues as I started to push out into draft and the whole draft and hold for the first time, which was a struggle. So maybe, maybe you have some tips for me on that side, but I, I'm not that great at draft and hold yet. I ran into so many injuries, but besides the point, yeah, there's so many guys going to driveline. I, this comes up all the time. I look at it very simply as projections are an average of a range of outcomes, right? I think we often miss that most of the time where we're looking at, you know, a range, like this guy could hit, his 70th percentile outcome, he could hit his 30th percentile outcome. But we're looking at, when we look at like a Zips projection or any of those projections, we're looking at what we think the average is. And we're not really accounting for that spread of, you know, some guys might have a tighter spread like that. You call those guys like probably high floor pitchers. And the high ceiling guys are really spread out generally because of some injury risk or something along those lines. When I hear a guy goes to drive line, I basically take that curve and flatten it a little more. I think the range of outcomes just gets bigger, especially skewed towards the positive. Because if projections are going off things that have happened, right, we're trying to predict based off past performance with maybe some underlying indicators and stuff, by gaining information that a guy's going to drive line, most of the time they're working on velocity, most of the time they're adding a new pitch or playing around with different options on the pitch side for them to have in their arsenal if they run into issues in the subsequent season. I just think that's not really baked into projections at all, really. So I'd like to just kind of target those guys if I think they're reasonably priced around ADP on the simple fact that I think there's some positive variance there that a projection maybe isn't capturing fully. I've always had this Galaxy Brand idea, too, of coming up with, like, projections that you could play around with. So, like, say I give this guy cutter, you know, a cutter that he hasn't thrown, like, what would Stuff Plus and Location Plus say about it? And then will that actually improve his projection? I imagine teams have this internally. I'm kind of waiting for it to come on the public side, but... Uh, I, I don't know if it actually ever will, but that's how I think about driveline, right? Like I just think it creates positive variance in guys generally because of velocity, because of shapes, because of improving things. And uh, that's kind of how I look at guys. I, I write them all down. I have a, I have a notion document right now running with guys that I see online training there. And when I get into draft season in March, I'll, I'll peek back at it and just kind of highlight those guys and make sure I'm aware of them. Awesome stuff. As you guys can tell by now, we are doing a pitching smorgasbord today. We're talking oh, yes. all about different kind of pitching, uh, the trying to figure out the state of starting pitching because I feel like that's kind of difficult right now with the new rules and like crackdown on sticky substances that have happened the past couple of years. We'll talk about analytics and pitching and scouting Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Shota Imanaga. I know you did a, a great a couple of videos on those two gents as well. Uh, splitters could splitters become the new rage in baseball and of course we will wrap up with some cubs pitchers and some uh, potential sleepers as well good to hear that you play fantasy baseball it's pretty awesome right like, yeah, you're, helps, out, right? you're out <laughs> in the NF- podcast. you're out in the nfbc street so that that's really cool to hear i know you told me a story about how uh you played in an nl only league with us with like an yeah. kind of league tell me more about that Quick, this is a quick story. This is funny. So I, I used to, I, I was actually an accountant. I, I got an undergraduate degree in accounting from UMass Amherst and worked in the city of Boston in public accounting at one of the big four accounting firms. I hated it. It was the worst thing in the world. I'm sorry if anyone listening is an accountant that works for big four, but I just, I did not understand how anyone could work like 70, 80 hours a week doing that stuff. So anyways, I very quickly realized I needed to pivot very hard. I ended up going to Northwestern for grad school, but I think this was 2017. It was Cody Bellinger's rookie year is all I remember. But anyways, there's a thing called busy season in accounting where everything gets really busy. And generally it's because of fiscal year closes. I'm not going to get into like what that is or anything, but anyways, I, you guys, I, I think Scott, why reached out or I reached out. I don't remember how it transpired, but he offered to, to have me in this league and it was an expert league. So at the time I was like, from building a credibility standpoint, this was really important. So I actually ended up calling out sick from work that day. Cause it's an auction. It's an NL only auction. It takes like eight hours. Like it's an entire right. day endeavor. So I, it was the middle of busy season. And I had to call out, of war. I just called out. I was just like, I'm not, I'm sick. You know what I mean? And throughout that entire day, my manager was calling me for all these questions and like asking me to do stuff. And I, I just couldn't answer. I had to draft this NL only team. And then I won. So I felt so vindicated. And it's primarily because I got Cody Bellinger, I think right before the reserve round, I bid like, I saved like two, three dollars and he ended up hitting like 39 home runs and it propelled me. But anyways, that's my little story. So I guess if you're trying to make it in the industry, call out of work and do an NL only expert draft. That is amazing. I kind of wish Scott was here so you could rub it in his face, the fact that you won the league. But I'll let him know when he gets back. 
Let's jump into the state of starting pitching. And, and Scott and I have kind of talked about this a lot already this offseason. I, I think we'll continue to try and figure out how to value pitchers and kind of the way things are trending. So ERA and WHIP were both up in 2023. I think that's no surprise compared to 2022, which was like this outlier low in terms of ERA and WHIP. And we saw that you know, pitching in general was just much better that year, whether it was the dead and ball, it was, you know, they were still kind of cracking down on the sticky substances, but not really. For whatever reason, pitching in 2022 was much better. 2023, we get the new rules. We got shift restrictions, stolen bases, offenses up in, I guess, a more organic way. That's the league that, that's the way the league wants it to be trending at this point. But overall, if you look at like really the t- past seven or eight years, like from a macro perspective, league-wide pitching stats, they haven't changed all that much, but the way that they are distributed has changed. So the elite aces, they're not really separating themselves as much as they have in years past. Again, like 2021, 2022, the aces were like far away and head and shoulders better than like the middle class of starting pitcher. Now it's kind of like been bunched down a little bit together. Scott talks a lot about this glob of starting pitching, which where it kind of feels like, Pitchers are all kind of similar from like the SP 35 to like 75 range. But what would you attribute that to? Like, how do you explain kind of what's happening in pitching right now? Is it just the the rules that have changed? Is it a combination of like the sticky substances? What do you attribute that to? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The rundown you gave me got me spiraling into a bunch of rabbit holes as I, as I was doing prep. And I don't actually know how much I totally prep for the individual questions you're going to ask, but I have thoughts. So um, I think it's due to how teams are approaching like the innings that they need to hit. Like there's a certain amount of innings. I don't remember what is the, is off the top of my head. It's like, it was like 1800 or something like that. A number could be off, but as a team, you have to get, you have to cover this many innings. And I think a lot of organizations look at the, however many men, 13 guys they have in a pitching staff, and in the minor leagues, like how are we going to cover all those innings? And I think the thing from that high level of a perspective that's happened is that you're starting to kind of shorten out guys. Like you're just, it, it relates back to the fact that guys aren't really going as deep into games because of the third time through the order penalty and the understanding that velocity also is something that's probably going to peak earlier in an outing for the most part. So we want to front load guys who are like three to five inning guys. Like you see what the Rays do, like around that five inning threshold. They don't really let a guy, a lot of guys turn over lineups a ton and pound velocity and don't throw deep into games. Don't run into those third time through the order penalties, master a couple pitches. And we will have better outsized results in that big sample of innings that we need to cover. That is, I think what is happening to a lot of, from the fantasy perspective, the reason that we're getting that blob as, or glob as, as Scott says And we're also running into situations, I think, where we're just not getting as many top-end pitchers that are separating. I think I pulled – I was looking at, like, Rasball has, like, historic roto values, right? Let me see if I can pull this up, where they look at – you know, you go back however many years, you go back way back and just look at dollar value production for individual guys. And I think I saw that – yeah, so $30-plus pitchers. So this is, like, ace-level pitchers. The last two seasons, we've had three of them. And then if you go back to 2021, you had four, 2020, you had five, 2019, you had four, 2018, you had six. So you're looking at like, you're just not, I, I think what's happening is because we're not getting as many guys going six or seven times through six, or seven innings, you're running in situations where guys are not prepared then to become those kinds of pitchers. So the sample at the top, the guys who are actually accumulating innings and wins and strikeouts, which are three of the five roto categories for pitchers. That has a huge impact on how much you can actually separate from the pack. And it makes those top and aces more valuable. I was always really resistant to drafting early SP, like starting pitchers. But, you know, I had a 15-team NFBC team last year that at the turn I went, where did I go? I think I went Garrett Cole, Corbin Burns. I passed on Schrader, which killed me. I didn't win the league. I think I came in like fourth, but just outside the money. But I, I've become more willing to understand, based on some of these trends, that these these guys who are really strong on the SP side of things, like the Coles and the Burns, et cetera, of the world, like can actually produce that $30 plus value and, and give you a return. But as it, just to your point, like I just don't think we're getting guys into the situations to put up outsized value, and, and that's hurting the total pool of pitching. We're also seeing more blowups too. And again, I don't know if that's more to do with the new rules that there's more of kind of like a snowball effect where, you know, once things kind of start going wrong, we see hit after hit because maybe shift restrictions or this guy steals a base. Okay. One single drives that guy in and things just kind of spiral out of control. So we see that more, even Spencer Schrider. I mean, 
he's dominant earlier in the year. Yeah. From yeah. Every perspective we look at, right. The ERA estimators K minus walk rate, just strikeout rate in general. He's like the top pitcher in baseball, but he has an ERA that's near four. So it's just so weird to see that. Is there anything that you can find maybe a common theme among the successful pitchers, right? Maybe those ones that are, you know, I guess above the glob, the top 20 or 25. Is there anything that you notice? Maybe it's the guys that have just done it before, right? The guys that we've seen go six, seven, eight innings consistently in the past, and we can kind of bank on them to do it again or whatever it might be, like strikeout rate. That seems like an obvious one, right? Just avoiding balls on play. But is there anything that you've noticed, like a common theme among the pitchers you see are successful? Yeah, I think it's really a spectrum. I think it's a matter of, I, I will say, like, I think that guys who command really good velocity generally are very good. Um, I think that's kind of, I'd say, a one-line thing that is far less common than I think we believe, right? Like, I, I think a Spencer Strider, like a Jacob deGrom, who, I mean, I, is at this point, like, is almost not even a fantasy pitcher anymore. You just don't even think about him. But he had the most incredible ability to dot 99 relative to anybody else in baseball like even relative to guys who were throwing 92 94 we don't we command is still something i think we're trying to understand i think you know saris is doing a really good job on the athletic of bringing in location plus and making that public we have walk rates you know if you go to driveline or any organization generally has like a miss distance which is really cool which is looking at individual pitch types and where that ball misses so like i throw a forcing fastball at the top of the zone if my i think my target is up like how much inch wise do i miss on average like, am I missing 12 inches? Am I missing 11? And, like, where's that rate relative to other guys trying to throw four things at the top of the zone? There's much more nuance to the topic of command. But I think one thing we generally understand about command is that as you throw harder, you're moving faster. It's harder to cr- control those finite finger movements that we think have some attachment to where you can place the ball and the consistency of that release, the vertical release angle. Those are really kind of nuanced topics that I think are really important to, to consistency of spotting a pitch. Maybe not necessarily consistent mechanics, but how you're getting to your release. Um so I think that a guy can, if a guy can spot 95 plus consistently, I I think you end up being pretty elite for the most part. And I think you run into a lot of situations where guys are are one or the other. You're on that spectrum of like command and stuff or command and velocity in that respect. And, I, you know, everyone has a gradation of it, but there's certain guys that I think really jump out that have elite velocity and also are able to command. And I really think that is probably my top line separator. I don't necessarily know how actionable that is for fantasy, but that's kind of how I think about pitching. Is like when I see a guy who's throwing that hard that could actually dot things, I start to get like a little more confident that there could, again, that range of outcomes that we could be looking at a, a better outsized outcome than the average. And that's interesting too, because there's you know very obvious ways to just see if that correlates, right? I mean, just measure a pitcher's velocity and look at his walk rate, right? And line those things up together. And, you know, the pitchers that throw harder and have, you know, reasonable walk rates are maybe potentially the pitchers that we should should be targeting. So something I think is worth looking into more this offseason. You mentioned location plus and some of the metrics that Eno Saris has put out in the past couple of years, stuff plus, location plus, pitching plus, and there are a ton of different oh metrics out there, right? There's just so much, and we'll talk about it. Like sometimes my even my head, I'm just spinning, like trying to put it together. <laughs> Crazy stuff. But uh, I think you do a great job of kind of, piecing those things together. You put them out in your daily in-season notes that are on your Substack. So again, I recommend everyone check that out. But what are some of the most common pitching analytics that you like to use? And if it's possible for you to reveal where to find those, because I think a lot of people who listen to us are still kind of trying to figure this out as well. Where do I find these? What do they mean? Kind of things, you know? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I look, I hate the answer of saying I kind of look at everything, but I kind of do for the most part where I'm looking at ERA as simple as it is, right? That's the stat you're getting credit for in fantasy, especially on a fantasy basis that matters, right? Even if it's not predictive year over year or something along those lines, you want to look at indicators that are more predictive of ERA than ERA itself. Totally understandable. FIP is isolating off what the pitcher can control, right? Strikeouts, walks, home runs. XFIP is kind of neutralizing that for a consistent home run rate. You know, you get into ERA and XERA. XERA is, I believe, from my understanding, is just at WOBA ported over to an ERA metric or XWOBA ported over to an ERA metric. So that's considering like exit velocity and I'm not considering spray angle, which is something that's a little more nuanced. But it's why a guy like Isak Paredes on the hitting side can kind of outperform some of his expected metrics so consistently because he pulls the ball a ton. Um, so there's in every stat you look at, there's like a limitation to it. And I think the hardest thing is to understand what those limitations are and understand what you're looking at. What what are you what are you looking at? What is it trying to tell you, right? That is the hardest thing, I think, 
on the fantasy side and even on just the general analysis side of things to figure out. So I look at a mix of everything. I recently got access to a site called True Media, which I've seen some other football analysts throw out there. It's not, they don't have a consumer product right now. They they are, they you can access it through some media organizations. And I I found the value in it from looking at pitch movement, looking at short form pitch movement, which isn't publicly available in real time, but True Media has it publicly available in real time. The real time pitch movement information on Savannah is slightly different. They measure vertical movement slightly differently. This is probably way too nuanced for a fantasy baseball podcast. But anyways, I really like True Media because it allows me to see real time pitch movement and stuff. So I like looking at things as granular as that. And then I like kind of zooming back out and looking at a stuff plus, which is that combination of velocity, release characteristics, and movement. And relative to how pitchers have performed, what do we think this pitch will do going forward? Is it above average? Is it league average? And then looking at uh, something like location plus is simply as optimally as just how often are you putting that pitch in a spot to succeed? You combine those two, I think you get a lot of the way there. I know Ian Harris did kind of a proof looking at his stuff and location model. He calls it like PP ERA, I believe he's pitching plus ERA. And it's pretty predictive. Like going forward, it's pretty predictive, he thought at least. And I, I kind of agree with it too. So for me, a lot of the time, it's trying to find a stat that I, I think I understand and making sure I know actually what it's outputting. I think I get caught up a lot of the time. In no offense to baseball perspectives at all. They do great work. And a lot of their stuff, I actually think from a numerical side is more predictive, but they have like DRA and all these other nuanced things. And sometimes I really struggle to understand what's going into that such that I don't really know what it's telling me. So I tend to stay away from some of those, even if the predictive value that R squared is slightly higher. Like I'll take something that's like a little bit lower on the R squared side of things. If I could just understand what it's telling me and understand where to look and how to not maybe take that as, as totally the, the Holy grail of an individual pitching stat. So it's a lot of, Nuanced things. I like stuff plus. I think it stabilizes really quick and gives you an idea of that pitcher stuff. Location plus it doesn't stabilize as quickly, but it does give you a pretty good proxy for command. Something as simple as like strike amount is walk rate too. I think is like it gets you like a really good amount of the way there. Um, you look at just a simple like fan graph sort of that stuff. Fan graphs is where I'm on a lot to get a lot of this information. I also love Alex Chamberlain's pitch leaderboard. Um, which is kind of a more nuanced thing. I don't know if you guys have mentioned it, but that has short form movement and gets a kind of a better understanding of how pitchers and pitching coaches talk about the movement of a baseball as it gets to, towards the plate. It doesn't update every day, but it updates probably every week in season and does a really good job of looking at like individual pitch characteristics from a discipline standpoint and really dig into like why is an individual pitcher effective? That's probably the question I'm trying to answer the most on my stub stack and anywhere else. Like, why is this guy effective? Why is this guy not been as effective? Or how could he become more effective? Those like simple questions, I think, are kind of how I piece everything together. Yeah, and that's a lot of what I'm we're doing in season too, right? Like, not only am I trying to watch games every single night, but I'm going through the baseball savant, the pitch usage, the velocity, yeah. and comparing that to like previous games and doing it for every pitcher. So like, yep. If anyone's ever Very wondering what I'm doing, yeah. if everyone's ever, ever wondering why we start at like 12:30 a.m. every single night, it's because <laughs> it takes a long time to like yeah, gather all that information and stuff. So, it, yeah, it, it is a lot of work, but it, it's it's very interesting to um I think point those things out on a daily basis. Again, if you want to kind of gain that edge in fantasy baseball, I have an Excel sheet. Like this is something I've done the past couple of years, where just the metrics I've noticed either other really smart people using or things that I like to use. I'll just kind of put them all on one sheet together. And for pitchers, for example, I have K minus walk rate, FIP, XFIP, Sierra, swinging, yeah, Sierra strike rate, yeah. swinging strike rate, stuff plus, location plus, pitching plus, and then just things that are pretty obvious, right? Like innings pitched from the previous season, projected innings pitched by Steamer and Steamer projection in terms of like a dollar value. So just yep. I guess kind of like, give it a little fantasy spin as well. So just like having all the data, but also having the fantasy spin and, you know, I, I'll tell you if it works, I guess we'll find out. If <laughs> yeah. Let me know. Here, right? like, you know, this is what I'm trying to look at and kind of base my rankings off of that. But uh, yeah, I'll, as I learn more, I'll let you know how that goes. Um, you mentioned, we mentioned all these different kinds of stats. Is there anything that you've noticed is the most predictive? Again, like you kind of mentioned, Eno you know, it was PP ERA, right? That's what yeah. I think it's pitching plus ERA is that, is that's that, prefix to the era is there is that like the one that you found that's most predictive so far or because honestly a, a lot of these era estimators what we hear is that they are descriptive not mm. predictive right it's like they're telling you what a pitcher has done so far but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what a pitcher is going to do moving forward so is there anything else that you found that is maybe more predictive than others yeah and it's tough because it's all it's all gradations right like nothing is 100 percent predictive everything is like 
uh, the R squareds there are like between three and 0.3 and 0.4. So it's saying that like, it's, if I understand some of the basic statistics here, like an R squared number is saying how much of that future variance is attributable to this individual statistic. So if it's around 0.3 or 0.4, you're saying like 30 to 40% is, descri is described by this individual stat we're looking at, you know? So that, that creates like 60% of other stuff that we just don't know, you know? Exactly. We don't know why it's great. It could be a variety of variables. So that's, it's tough as to what is most predictive. I think, again, it goes back to my point of just like making sure you understand the inputs, making sure you kind of have an idea of what's going on. And that's why I lean on like a, a PPERA where it's just, it's easier for me to know that he's going off location plus and stuff plus, which I think I understand really well. And he's mixing some park variables and some other things. So I like that. I, I think that that's a really good way to look at things. Um, and again, like in a skills independent ERA, like Sierra is pretty good too. That's looking more at ball and play outcomes. And I mentioned earlier in this podcast that I got into a rabbit hole. That's what I got into the rabbit hole of was I, I literally spent like 45 minutes toggling through the, you know, I don't know if you run into this, you, you read an article and it's really good, but within that article, they're often linking to other things. And I often find that the things they're linking to, I, I like, I'm 25% of the way through one piece and I open up another one and that piece yeah. is like two times as long. And I, then I go through that one and then I'm like trying to circle back. So I have like six tabs open and it's a disaster, but what a pitcher can control in batted ball outcomes is the rabbit hole I got into. And skills independent ERA brings that into consideration. Whereas like a fit doesn't, a fit is basically saying like, Hey, I, I don't really think you have too much influence over it. And I, we use FIP a lot because I think it makes a lot of sense. But I do think fundamentally, almost every organization believes that pitchers actually do exert some control over batted ball outcomes. And the thing that I started to kind of understand a little bit more in digging through this, and I have thought about in the past, is that, you know, exit velocity is more what a hitter could control. And launch angle is something that more so a pitcher maybe has some more influence over. And that's a byproduct of location. Launch angle is heavily, heavily influenced by vertical and horizontal location, particularly vertical location. You think of like forcing fastballs with some hop up in the zone. You're going to create fly balls, right? That's you're looking for a launch angle there that's potentially very steep to the point where it's not going to end up being a home run. And it actually starts to diminish in terms of that bad ball outcome. And then the same thing for like a Logan Webb. He's pitching down in the zone with a sinker. If you're consistently putting that ball down in the zone, it, this goes back to the idea of like command, trying to quantify command to some extent. Um, if he's consistently putting that ball down in the zone, the probability of there being a ground ball is higher. So I think pitchers exert some control over that element of launching, or as, as hitters maybe exert more control over like the exit velocity side of things. So I like looking at a Sierra because they're starting to maybe consider some more of that ball and play nuance that other things might be missing. And I'm sure you've seen guys like this all the time. Like Bryce Elder is a great example last year where he has like some kind of weird pitch metrics where he's a high slot guy who can throw a sinker. So he's getting a lot of drop. That ball approaches the zone really steep. That is relatively unique to other right-handed pitchers in baseball. So I thought for a period of time last year that it was reasonable he was outperforming some of his metrics until the league caught up. That gets into more of the nuance of like, okay, well, when as a fantasy owner do I kind of let Elder go? Like we, we thought he would implode at some point. He kind of struggled at the end of the year. But if I could get three months out of a guy being like a 3-5 pitcher off the waiver, like I'm hyped. You know what I mean? Like that's amazing. So it's like I like trying to isolate off and find like some nuance that might take the league a little to understand what's going on with the individual pitcher. But that was a bit of a rambling uh, talk there, but I wanted to get into that rabbit hole of like, what can a pitcher control? And that I think is really important. I don't think there's a direct answer to it, but I, I like that idea of them being able to control launching a little more than exit velocity. And it's so interesting. I, I think it is really nuanced too. And I think it depends on the pitcher. And I could be wrong about this, but this is just kind of the way that I'm deducing it in my head is that, you know, someone like a, a Framber Valdez or even a Kyle Hendricks, like they, they throw a bunch of sinkers. They want to keep the ball down in the zone for the reasons you mentioned to get ground balls. Someone like Christian Javier, who has this kind of rising fastball effect that he throws up in the zone to try and get infield pop-ups and fly balls that don't turn into home runs. Those guys are very clearly, I think, trying to influence where the ball is coming off of the bat. For but sure. then I also think that there are other pitchers that are just like power pitchers where they're Yep. In their mind, they're probably just trying to throw it past this guy, right? Like, let me just throw oh, a yeah. fastball, like, away in the zone and try and get a swing and miss. Or, like, I'm not trying to induce, like, a ground ball or anything. I want to throw a slider down and away to a righty and try and get a strikeout, right? Like, so, yeah, it is really, really interesting and nuanced because it's like, how do you capture that? How do you capture which pitchers are purposely trying to influ influence launch angle and which ones aren't? It's a good point. I think the quick way that I'll respond to that is like, I, I think stuff plus and location plus do a really good job of this. They're, they're available publicly on fan graphs. Um, Cause I, I look at this all the time. I think of the modern pitcher as a guy who has like a 125 stuff plus, right? Banger slider, 3000 RPM. He's got a big sweeper. It's 84. It's harder than other sweepers. You know, maybe he's got a little hop to his fastball. That's unexpected for a guy who's got that much sweep. 
nasty change up with a ton of bite. So you see this stuff plus at like 120, right? Which is like almost two standard deviations above the average. You're like, oh yeah, let's go. And then you look at the location plus and it's like a 90. And it's like, oh, he's actually a reliever, you know? But it's like, we're going to try to make him a starter. Like that is, I think, how you can maybe isolate off and find that power pitcher. But I, I, I run into that all the time because – you know, Sarah's also has some like minor league statistics and I have access to an individual in an organization who gives me some minor league stats. So I could kind of figure out the stuff plus of double A pitchers and high A pitchers if I want to. And triple A, I believe that's publicly available on Prospects Live. I think they have some stuff up around pitch shapes and stuff. So you can kind of back into like what the stuff plus is of a guy coming up. You kind of don't have to wait for the public to know. That's one of the maybe minor edges I think I have in the game, but in fantasy baseball specifically. But yeah, that's it's I, I run to that all the time. Like I was looking at uh, you guys, I listened to your most recent podcast where you were talking about starting pitching prospects. I have some thoughts there, of course. I'm always looking at minor league guys. And uh, Jackson Job was one that jumped to me earlier in the year when I saw some of his L data because he had really strong stuff plus, but the location plus wasn't terrible. And he had a little more of a sample there, too. I think he had three stars where he was on one of the stadiums in the AFL that had track man. So he had like a 96 or 97 location plus. Not enough to stabilize it, but it was more encouraging than like one of the starts I saw from Ricky Tiedemann where he had like an 80-85, which is like, from what I understand about location plus and some of the command metrics, if you're in reliever territory, it's, it's really hard to be a starting pitcher. So I don't know if I'm totally concerned about like a Ricky Tiedemann versus a Jackson Joe, but I was slightly encouraged that Jackson Joe had three starts where he was kind of around this, this starter uh, territory of location, despite having really strong stuff. So I, I kind of ticked him up mentally in my brain a little. Um, but yeah, that combination of like, do you have great stuff, which I think translates to being a power pitcher? And then do you have actually the command to be able to spot it? Which I think goes back to my point that I mentioned earlier of like, you got Velo and you can command it. Like, I, I really like that profile. Yeah. All right. Let's take our first break. We do have a bunch of other pitchers we want to get to here. A uh, quick note before we do that. FBT is a finalist for the best baseball podcast cat category in this year's sports podcast awards. And thanks to all of our listeners we actually won this award last year, so we're looking to go back to back. And to help us bring home the hardware, you can find the link in the podcast and YouTube descriptions or scan the QR code, which is on the screen right now. The whole process should take you less than a minute, and we really do appreciate it. Thank you for your continued support. We're trying to go back to back. So uh, help us out, and uh, let's take our first break. When we return, let's talk about specific players. Yamamoto, Imanaga. I want to talk about this kind of splitter usage that we think could be on the rise. We'll do all that right after this. Wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only Morning Footy Team. Rise and shine, football fans. Welcome to Morning Footy. Start your all-day football craze with Morning Footy, part of the all-new Galazzo Network. Welcome back in. We're here with Lance Brozdowski, and let's talk about some of these breakdowns you did on Yoshinobu Yamamoto and Shota Imanaga. You did these on your YouTube channel. Highly recommend everyone checks them out. Uh, we'll start with Yamamoto. 25-year-old Japanese phenom who just came off a season with a 116 ERA and a .86 whip over a strikeout per inning. He has posted an ERA of 1.7 or lower three years in a row. And each of those three years, he won the Sawamura Award, which is the equivalent of the Cy Young in Japan. He also has won the league MVP each of the past three years. Now, this is where I think the tone could change a little bit. Because you threw a little bit more cold water on Yamamoto during your breakdown. So talk to me about some of the things that you noticed that you think could maybe cause um, maybe a little bit of a period where he has to make some adjustments and maybe he doesn't get off to like this great start that some people think he might. What do you see uh, when breaking down Yamamoto? Yeah, I, I honestly hate that I made this video and it got as much traction as it did. Because I – listen, like I, I – before he went to the Dodgers, which I think is just going to kill everything because I, I love what the Dodgers do from an optimizing pitcher standpoint. So I, I give them a lot of leeway when they acquire a guy, you know, even, even if Lance Lynn wasn't totally successful, he had some starts where he was usable last year. Anyways, I was talking to people in baseball about him and a lot of people expressed hes hesitancy where they were like, listen, I, I think it's pitchability profile. I think the most, for the most part, he's getting really good money because he's 25. Like we just don't have a 25 year old pitcher hit the market to be able to give him 10 years. So it's like, I actually think he might get 250 plus and then it became 300 million plus, you know? So I put this out because I had a couple of people who I respected tell me that like they thought he might struggle immediately with some adjustments. So I was like, all right, everything I've seen on him has been positive. Why don't I put together a video that's like maybe more lukewarm maybe people will learn from it. Little did I know that like everyone attacked me in the comments of just like, I can't believe you don't like this guy. And it's like, 
I don't know if I wasn't clear about my point in that video, but I, <laughs> I value contrasting perspectives a lot in what I read and what I think and talking to people. Like I want to know why someone disagrees with me, you know? So in right in making this video about Yamamoto, I wanted to be a little more lukewarm because I just thought it would be more valuable for people to consider maybe why he doesn't get off to like a crazy good start. And then he went to the Dodgers and now I'm going to be totally wrong and I feel terrible about it. But anyways, to put on that hat of skepticism around Yamamoto, it is more of a pitchability profile, right? Like he is a guy that I think does something kind of funky with his four seam from the location data I've seen and also some of the minor WBC stuff where he's able to actually dot his four seam outer third versus righties and go up with it, which is very similar to like what, what a Garrett Cole does. You can contrast a Garrett Cole with like a Carlos Rodon where like Rodon, if you look at his heat maps, he's throwing this fastball one spot entire time, no matter what. And I just don't think he has the innate level of command like a Garrett Cole does. Like Garrett Cole works off that outer third to put up his slider line. He also goes for four seam up. Like he mixes things in a really unique way because he has the command to be able to do that. And I think Yamamoto represents that same ability. He's got the ability to kind of go back to where this four seam, he throws it up a little, he throws it down too, which is something we can get into with the Monaga where the MVP guys just throw it down a lot. I think a Monaga particularly has to elevate more. And like Yamamoto, he even pitched a little inside with the Torides as well, which I like. So you have kind of these nuanced pitchability elements that I don't think a pure stuff plus is going to capture. Despite that, stuff plus and the stuff is is really strong. I was slightly concerned that the forcing didn't get a ton of swing and miss in MPB. And everyone was like, I understand. Like everyone just told me that's because of the contact nature. But I, I get that that's the contact nature of guys over in MPB. But we've also seen, even if strikeout rates go up, in the major leagues, that's primarily driven by more off-speed usage, less forcing usage. It's not really driven by forcing getting more swing miss in zone, for example. So that is a great example. Like Kodai Senga is similar. Like I know he doesn't have the same level of innate command that a Yamamoto does, but Senga's fastball was like, I think right out a little bit worse, but he had sub like 20% swinging strike rate where the average is somewhere around 22%. He comes over and that's his worst pitch his repertoire and dropped to like 18. And slowly you saw throughout the year, saying it backed off the forcing usage and threw everything else. So I'm most curious about the forcing usage and what the Dodgers do with it and how much maybe they rely on other pitches in his repertoire, or if they like the idea of him throwing the fastball 50, 47% of the time, somewhere in that window, because they think the pitchability is good enough. So that's the more the growing pain that I think he could run into is just like, I'm used to throwing this fastball all the time. I get I could spot it, but like against major league hitters, even be able to spot it might create some risk of damage in barrels. So like, let's back off that usage, bring it down to like 45, 42, 41, and then throw some other pitches, like throw the splitter, which is filthy. I'm curious to see if they tinker with anything on the slider side of things to get more swing and miss versus right-handed hitters. There's some nuance around his profile that I think creates, I, I just say variance. I'll just say variance in the first couple months and even the first maybe year of this contract. But the problem here is that the Dodgers do a really good job of extracting immediate value from these guys. So I, I'm I'm in on him. Like I, I'll put it on a record. Like I like where his ADP is right now. I actually think, again, thinking of that range of outcomes, how I think of a lot of pitchers, like he I think he has a chance to be like the SP2 this year, like number two or three pitcher in all in in fantasy specifically. And I think he's got a clear shot at the Cy Young as well. Just from a pure standpoint of I think the Dodgers are really interesting and in being able to maximize the value of these guys immediately, you know, you have to again accept a lot of risk of him being slightly smaller, which whatever in terms of whether that causes injuries, but also adjustment to the ball, adjustment to the routine, how many innings he's going to throw. Like that's it. There's a lot of things in there that matter. Uh, Dodger Stadium too allows a lot of home runs on, on fly balls and line drives. I don't think a lot of people maybe think about that and realize it, but the ball's in the air for the most part there. Like he will create, I think he's going to give up some home runs in that respect, even though he hasn't really given up too much. So I that gets into another angle of like, well, what if behind in the count they start throwing sinker more with him? Like I think his natural arm path leads it leads him to having a, a little more sinker usage over here. So there's again all these like push and pull that I think the Dodgers are gonna do a better job of preempting maybe than other orgs would. So I'm eating crow on this one. I, I think he's good. Like I just wanted to do something different, and clearly I should not do that. <laughs> First and foremost, Lance, you haven't made it on YouTube until you get some nasty comments. So you should feel good about that fact <laughs> because look. You're going to you're going to ruffle some feathers. I like that aspect. I'm like you. I like to hear differing opinions. I always said to me, the best content for really for fantasy is to hear both sides of the argument, to hear people totally. kind of, you know, one person likes this player. One person doesn't like this player. Let's argue about it. And then the listener gets to decide, OK, which person do I agree with more or which person made more points that I agree with? And that's that's really what it should be. So I, I actually appreciate the fact that, you know, you looked at it from that perspective. And you know, I mentioned when we did our Yamamoto podcast, when he first signed with the Dodgers, the price tag is on the rise like crazy 
because of this great article that Eno Saris put out over at the Athletic, yeah, yeah. scouting each of the pitches and really just kind of talking about, well, all right, he's going to have an elite fastball. He's going to have a splitter that's like uh, a splitter that's on par with Kevin Gosman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's going to have great control, right? And like you read that, okay, now it's on the rise because the ADP before that article was 74.5 as the 22nd starting pitcher off the board. Since that article has been published on December 12th, the ADP is 54.7 as the 13th starting pitcher off the board. Let me ask you, do you agree with that price tag? Knowing what you know, the variance that you think he could finish as a top three starting pitcher, but maybe the downside where there could be an adjustment period. Uh, do you think SP 13 is kind of like that right range to be targeting Yamamoto? Yeah, I do. I, I think I like him in that window, honestly. Um, yeah, I'm looking at ADP right now. It's around 50. So he's going around guys like like a Snell, um, around a couple relievers, Tariq Skubal. That's probably a really interesting one is Skubal versus Yamamoto, where Skubal had like a great – like he was one of the best pitchers in baseball from I think was it July onward. Yeah. Really awesome peripherals. I actually really like what the Tigers are doing internally on the pitching side. Um I was at a big nerd conference at Wake Forest and I met their assistant pitching coach there and chatted up with him. And I think they're, they're a team that is on the up and up um, from the pitching side of things. We might be giving them more respect in a couple of years, being able to extract value from guys, um, which is, makes me curious to see like what, like what a Kenta Maeda does, but that's a separate story. But yeah, like Scooball versus Yamamoto is a great example. I think Yamamoto's probably taken above Scooball by the time this all settles in March, I would bet glass now or Yamamoto. That's interesting too. Like, I think he's in the proper range and it's, it's, it's again, because I think there's massive upside in his profile. Like I think there's a chance he ends up, we look back and he's like the SP two, he's SP two or three, like Strider's one, he's two, he's ahead of Cole. I think there's a reasonable chance of it. Yeah. I, I think we kind of settled on that range too. When we were kind of discussing, all right, how do we rank Yamamoto now that he's signed with the Dodgers? Scooble and Glass now, I think that there's a pretty wide range of outcomes for those guys. Glass now, it's all about health. Okay, if he stays healthy for 160 plus innings, I think he could very easily be a top five pitcher for fantasy. Tarek Scooble, he's currently projected as like the SP4 by Steamer, and he has all these yeah. amazing peripherals, and he was great in the second half, and he's an ascending young pitcher, uh, pitches in a good ballpark. So I, I think there's lots like there, but he hasn't done it over like 150, 60, 70 innings yet. So I think there's some variance there. And obviously, I think anytime we get a pitcher you know, coming from overseas, again, there could be an adjustment period. So that obviously creates some variance as well. I think it's a good range. I, I think that SP 10 to 12 makes sense for Yamamoto. Let's talk about Imanaga, who is going much later. And we can talk about that in a second. But just to give people a little background, 30-year-old lefty coming over from Japan, coming off a 266 ERA, 102 whip, well over a strikeout per inning, 10.6 K per nine, 7.8 K to walk ratio. So mm. that is amazing stuff. And just taking a look at the arsenal, it's mostly fastball sweeper splitter. Doesn't throw incredibly hard, 92 to 93 miles per hour. But as you pointed out in your breakdown, he kind of throws from this funky arm angle as a lefty where he creates this like interesting vertical approach angle. And it's like lots of fly balls. That's something that has played the past couple of years in uh, Major League Baseball, I do wonder if, like, people are starting to catch up to it a little bit. I know there's been, like, yeah, some you're right. yeah. articles and whispers and, and some research done that, like, all right, the league might be catching up to this kind of, like, rising fastball. Tell me what you saw from Shota Imanaga and the fact that, like, he is going so late right now. I mean, he's, like, outside the top 250 in ADP. Yeah, yeah, he's super late. The problem is, like, I, I saw his ADP, and then he's around some other guys that I kind of like from what I saw. Like, he's near... And they're injury guys, but like Tristan McKenzie and Nick Lodolo, like those are interesting arms. I'm curious to see where Lucas Giolito goes. He's around that ADP. You run into a couple of relievers there. Like if you're in on Mason Miller, his, his ADP is probably going to rise if they ever announce him as the closer. You know, Kenta Maeda I was just talking about in that same window. So I, I wish he was around other pitchers that I, I'd be more confident in going after him. But yeah, you, you mentioned, you hit the nail on the head. Like he's got a really hoppy fastball. It's got like 20, 20 inches of vertical break or so, which is well above the average, you know, you have to adjust for arm arm slot and some other things too, but the average is around 16 um, for a four seam fastball. The other thing is that you just don't see that from the left side a lot. The two guys that I comp them to were Alex Vesey and Mr. Cortez who throw similar four seam fastballs. Both of them pitch up in the zone a lot in Managa over an MPB did not pitch up in the zone a ton. So I think that's a clear adjustment that he's going to make that'll actually flatten out that vertical approach even more. That's just the angle of the ball entering the zone, um, which is influenced by location really, really heavily. So you do have to kind of adjust for it. Um, but 
Yeah, he's he's a good pitcher. Like I, I think he's solid. I, I wonder how many innings we're going to get out of him. That's maybe one of the hesitations. Most of the reporting I've seen is something along the lines of like, yeah, we think he's a back end starter, and then like as you get late in the year, potentially moves into more of a relief role, or you know, and you get into the playoffs. If it's a playoff team that acquires him, maybe he's more like a, a playoff reliever kind of type. And if the team is in contention, maybe they move him earlier into that role to preserve innings and something along those lines. So like, I like the mix. I think it's fine. He does allow a ton of fly balls, which is a thing that I'm looking at from the perspective of what park he goes to. If he goes to like, he's not going to go to the Reds, but if he goes to like a great American, like I'd be a little more concerned than if he goes to like the Royals, which he's probably also not going to go to, but think of like that, that disparity in terms of how, how much damage fly balls can really create in that respect. So I like him. I like him at the ADP. I'm, I, you know, I don't remember who it was, but there's always, there's another analyst out there. Always, it's always sticks in my head is like, you don't really know how you value a guy until you're in a draft room and you're staring at him as to whether you actually take him. Yeah. So I'm not exactly sure if you're putting Giolito, Imanaga, Nick Lodolo. I actually like Christopher Sanchez a little too. I think his ADP is a little high right now, though. I thought he'd be more of a dark horse. That's the Philly lefty who has some funky shapes. And a Tristan McKenzie. Like, all those guys are on the board. I need a pitcher. Who am I going with? I'm not exactly sure if Imanaga is at the top of my list right there just because I like some of those other arms around there. Even like a Brandon Fott is a little above that, but maybe he would fall back. There's a couple of relievers. So I, I struggle a little with if I'm on the clock, would I actually take him from a fantasy perspective? But I do think he's a guy that could provide some value. I think maybe he's he has some risk in the profile, but I actually think he's maybe slightly safer than some of these injury guys around here. So I, I struggle with him from a fantasy perspective. From a real-life perspective, I think I think he'll be good. I think he's like a, a pretty good pitcher, and I, I'd be pretty surprised if he gets completely blown up. And I'd be pretty surprised if a team doesn't just have him throw up in the zone more, zone more with the four seam. And that really maybe helps out some of the, the you know, translation to MLB hitters and, and how that will all work. But that fastball is funky. Like Vessia and Cortez have both had really good success with it. So I, I'm curious to see how he does. I like it, man. I, I like where the price tag is at. Again, the ADP from December 1st on 238.7. I do like some other names in there in this range. I think this is a good range to shop for like your SP5, your SP6, something like that in Agreed. a draft. Between Imanaga and Lodolo, you mentioned. Christopher Sanchez, I like quite a bit as well. Uh, this seems like a pretty good range, but I, I do like Imanaga. Everything I've read, everything I've seen. Just to put things in perspective, I do think there might be a little bit of the fact that Imanaga is coming over at the same time as Yamamoto. Maybe he's being overshadowed a little bit because Kodai Senga's ADP, you look at his numbers in Japan, his age, when he came over, his ADP last year was 184. That's like yeah. 60 spots higher than where Imanaga is going right now. So that, to me, that's just like a little surprising. And I think we're getting a pretty good discount on Shota Imanaga. Last question on him, asking for a friend. Let's say your favorite team just missed out on, you know, Yamamoto or something. Should we be hoping that they sign Imanaga instead? You know, someone like the Yankees. Yeah. Tough. <laughs> so depends on that team because I think it's so park based with how many fly balls he allows. That, I think it be... work in Yankee Stadium just because as a lefty, yeah, a he's point. not going to, I guess, face as many lefties. So you don't have to worry about the short porch. And left yeah. field in Yankee Stadium is, is actually pretty big. So it's true. It's a good point. Yeah. You, yeah. You, hit, you hit the nail on the head there. I, I think they've been linked to some other guys. Like they've been linked to Jordan Montgomery. Who's going to be much? I think much more expensive. I, I guess we'll see exactly how the market sells. The Yuki Matsui market, the reliever for the Padres, that settled a lot lower than I thought it was going to, based on projections. So, I'm not sure what teams are seeing there with him that makes him a little more hesitant. I love. I mean, we talked about splitters. I might be uh, putting the cart before the horse here, but he's got a splitter, and I, I think maybe there's a chance that he's actually pretty good if they announce him as a closer, um, because I love splitters. Um, but yeah, I guess. It seems to me like the rhetoric around New York, for example, is that they maybe would prefer a Montgomery. And that just might be more from a familiarity perspective. But, you know, I I, I guess, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. Like, I, I always like get asked, like, these questions on air here all the time where it's like, oh, what would you pay for him? And it's like, it's not my money, man. Like, I, <laughs> I, I, I pay all the – I pay the billion dollars for Otani and Yamamoto, you know? Like, I, <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm now trying to figure out his performance regardless of the monetary side. So, I would take I would take a Monica for sure and see how he does. And, again, I think there's some very obvious low-hanging fruit adjustments, and I, I'm curious to see how much they help and mitigate maybe some of the fly ball issues. To quote the famous gif of the little girl, she's like, why not both? I, exactly. <laughs> as a Yankee fan, I'm like, if you're willing to spend $300 million on Yamamoto, why wouldn't you just sign Jordan Montgomery and Imanaga? I mean, it's a great point. Yeah. You never have enough pitching, right? So that's kind of where I'm at. But, you know, I just had to get my little uh, Yankee spiel out of the way. Let's take <laughs> our final break. When we return, we'll talk about this new wave of pitching 
Uh, more splitters coming on the way potentially. We'll wrap up with some Cubs, maybe some sleeper starting pitchers. We'll do that right after this. We well, need your sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ anywhere, anytime, all the time. Welcome back in. We are here with Lance Brzezowski, and let's talk about this potential new wave of pitching. So we know sweepers have been all the rage this past year. I heard you on foul territory, and you kind of throw out the possibility that you think we could see more splitters in the future. Why is that? It's a really good pitch. It's the best pitch in baseball at generating swing and miss and limiting hard contact. So if you're looking at the perspective of how to get out, so like I, I talk to, I like talking to coaches and coordinators, pitching coordinators are generally like the overseers of a minor league pitching department for any individual organization. Usually there's a couple of them, but sometimes there's one that kind of heads a lot of the decision-making and general high level philosophy, like what an organization wants to value and, and do. And a lot of the time they're just like, I just want to figure out how to get outs. Like I want outs. Like I don't really care how they're coming most of the time. You know, like you obviously want to get it through swing and miss, probably a little more predictable. But in hearing that so much, it just makes so much sense for me to give you the pitch that creates the highest probability of an out, right? Like, uh, it's a splitter. Like, and I get we might run into the situation where there's maybe more bad splitters, which we're kind of running into with sweepers, such that the you might think, oh, the league's getting better versus sweepers. It's like, well, there's just more bad sweepers. So is the, you know, if, if you were to, if there was a way to figure out, like, stuff plus, if Stuff Plus was on Stackass, for example, maybe we could search and see, like, is the league actually getting better versus Stuff Plus sweepers that are above, you know, 10%, 20% above average, like the really good ones? Are they figuring out how to hit those better? Or is it more that there's just more hanging around the middle and those are the ones they're getting better against? But maybe that happens with splitters. I really like splitters. The thing you hear all the time, and I get shredded again in the comments for this everywhere I mention it, is just it causes injuries. I was even on air with one of our analysts here who's a little more old school, one of the reporters in the area. And he looked at me on a camera. He's just like, it's just going to cause injuries. And I was like, show me the data because there's nothing out there on it. Right. And now that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Right. There's a lot of things that I think in baseball where we slowly understand that perhaps it is actually something that matters. And maybe we don't have data to back it up. Maybe it's more anecdotal, but it doesn't mean just because it's anecdotal, it's incorrect. It just means we don't really have the objective evidence to support it. So with splitters, I, I don't necessarily think they cause injury. Like there's not a direct correlation. I don't think, and I haven't seen one and I've had coaches ask me to give it to them because I have brought it up before. Like I haven't seen that anywhere. Where are you looking? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I've heard it from people so much that I think there's maybe a shred of truth, but I do think that we're seeing some organizations are more tolerance to it. And this is the Mariners in particular, giving it to guys like Kirby and Logan Gilbert. Gilbert has huge hands. There's finger width, finger size, hand size has some implication on it as well. I also think there's different ways to get to splitter movement with different orientations and grip. You're seeing a lot of split changeups to Joe Ryan where you know, you think of the Yamamoto pitch where he's literally wedging the ball between his fingers. You can literally like spread your fingers and you'll feel like your forearm muscle kind of tighten up as you do that. There's different kinds of splitters where if you're more of like a natural pronator, you can lay on the seam and not actually split the ball in between your fingers and not get perhaps that same forearm pressure. So I think there's much more nuance to the topic of like, does it cause injuries? They're generally thrown harder than changeups and they have more drop. Velocity has some correlation to injury. Velocity also has correlation to success. So you have to think of that risk reward of like, I, you know, the, the case against weighted balls, like it causes injuries. And my favorite comment I ever heard in reaction to this was, okay, well, how hard do you throw? Like this pretend it's a conversation. Like I don't want to throw weighted balls because I think it's going to cause for me to get injured. And the pitcher throws 89 and the pitching coach looks at him and goes, well, you suck. So it doesn't really like, do you not want to have the chance to be a major league pitcher? Like Alex Cobb talks about this a lot too, where he's had a ton of injuries. He's gone through some crazy rejuvenations and changes. He's taken risks and he's a major league pitcher. So like, and he's been injured a lot. <laughs> so your goal is to be a major league pitcher and get outs. Like, I don't, I get the goal is to be healthy in the major leagues, but I don't think that that's the primary goal because if that was the primary goal, you probably just wouldn't throw, right? You just wouldn't have a pitching staff. Like we want you to be healthy. We don't want you to have arm injuries. So just don't throw and then you won't get injured. So I think there's a lot more nuance around the splitter topic that I just don't think we have a great understanding of. I, I've heard a lot on the sweeper side where sometimes it just doesn't fit the guy's throw or he's not used to supinating getting to the front of the ball enough as much to throw this pitch 30, 40% of the time out of the gate after never throwing it, you know, and maybe that leads to some injury increase. I think of this in relation to like, you don't do a, you go to the gym for a year and then you take a year off. Then you go back the next year and you immediately hit like an 80% squat right out the gate. It's like, you're going to hurt. 
like your injury risk is going way up. Like there's generally like a buildup period. So perhaps there's a way, you know, over a two year period to slowly introduce that guy into a splitter to mitigate some of the risk of, of issue and injuries. I just think there's so much nuance to it. I know teams are thinking about this because I've talked to them about it. I've talked to some organizations about it. Everyone is kind of on this idea. I'm just curious as to whether we actually get a wave of it or if it's just, you know, it's going to be the Mariners giving it to three or four of their starters and then everyone seeing it works and then maybe everyone follows suit. It's just, it's, it's going to take that one team to like be like, yeah, we gave, we have now four starters with splitters and they all learned them in the last two years and none of them got injured yet. So like, do you really think it causes injuries? And then teams are maybe going to introspect and go, man, those, they have the third best pitching staff in baseball. It's like, maybe we are willing to take that risk as the 27th best pitching staff in baseball that one of our guys gets injured. You know, like there's that risk reward. We don't think about enough. I think it's, it's just really, I don't want to say it's ignorant, but it's just, it's missing the point to just say, don't throw the pitch because you could get injured. So that's kind of my rambling thoughts as to why I think it could come to the forefront. And I do think the word nuance is probably like the the hot topic The is the key word of today's podcast, because exactly. I'm just thinking through Kevin Gosman is like the face of splitter usage. Right. And he doesn't even throw like a wedge split. He throws like an offset split. So like, I he, don't think he's getting as much like finger pressure as like a Kodai Sanger or something. So and he's, I, thrown he he's thrown 174 plus innings three years in a row. But yeah, that, I mean, again, it's like, Everyone is different. Not everyone is Kevin Gosman. Not everyone has like the same hand size as Kevin Gosman or is used to throwing this pitch as much. Right. So again, it's, uh, there is a lot of nuance. I just, I don't know that you want to, like you said, just rush a pitcher into like making the splitter his most used pitch, but kind of slowly breaking it in. And we saw that again with the Mariners who kind of seem like they're at the forefront here. Logan Gilbert didn't throw a splitter in 2022 this past season. He threw it around 15% of the time. George Kirby, he only used a splitter about like 6% this season, yeah. but that went up in the second half. It was basically non-existent in the first half, and then he th- used it about 12% in the second half, and it was a really good whiff pitch for George Kirby, and if you think, you're think you thinking about it from a fantasy perspective, if he starts to use this splitter 10 to 15% of the time, and that gets him up to even a strikeout per inning, given the ratios and the team that he pitches for should get a decent amount of wins, like, that could turn George Kirby into a legit like SP one, like top 10 starting pitcher for fantasy. So it's really interesting for me to think about it from that perspective. And then even someone that's going really late in drafts, Bryce Miller, I I saw you either retweet or put out some video that he's in driveline working on a splitter now. So very clearly this is on the mind of the Seattle Mariners organization. And we might be able to see their pitchers take that step forward. I mean, specifically someone like Bryce Miller, he's going so late in drafts that, Maybe this is another reason to target him. No, I totally agree with that. I don't know if Bryce Miller was at driveline, but I did post that. And I, I don't remember what facility he was at, but he's he seems to be learning one. And that's he was an interesting one. I made a video on him earlier this year where I was like, okay, the differential, like release point differential, we're not entirely sure how much it really matters. Like Ricky Tiedman, you guys were talking about, where his is so massive that maybe it does to some extent. But a Bryce Miller has a similar situation. Miller was around there where it's like he drops his slot so much on his changeup that I always theorize like, well, if you could maintain that fastball release and then go to a pitch that you could create a similar amount of break. I wonder if that would be more deceptive. So I really like that angle on a Bryce. I mean, this goes back to the first question you asked me, right? Like when a guy adds a new pitcher, goes to a driveline or is working at a facility and we get that information bubbled up. Like the fact that Miller might have a new primary off-speed pitch in a splitter over a changeup. And we think it's probably a better, we can theorize it could be a better offering. Like that is, that is not something that's accounted for in a projection, right? That is something you can anecdotally add into a projection and make you a little more confident in taking him a little above ADP. And again, if you get into March and he's dominating in spring, that pitch looks filthy, he's going to increase. So like, this is maybe more of an off season idea, but, but yeah, I, I just think that stuff creates variance uh, for sure. All right. I only want to keep you around for a few more minutes here. Uh, obviously, thankfully you, you've, yeah, I, wanna, I, I rambled there. I went long, man. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, good. I, I want to ask you specifically about Justin Steele. Obviously you work, you're very, you work very closely with the Chicago Cubs. So I want to ask you about Steele, maybe some uh, sleepers that you're looking for, looking at for the 2024 season, specifically with Steele. I mean, obviously a breakout year for him, 306 ERA, 117 whip over a strikeout per inning, unique two pitch pitcher. It's fastball slider. Doesn't throw particularly hard. He improved his control dramatically. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about that. How much do you think he can maintain the control gains for Justin Steele? And how much do you value someone like him where the stuff plus is actually below average? I mean, it rates yeah, out yeah. as like a 99 stuff plus league average is 100. How much does that factor in? So control and stuff plus for Justin Steele. 
Yeah, the nugget I have on the control side is that in talking to him and some of the pitching brass here, they really just simplified everything he was doing. And you can prove this out a little by looking at Savant heat maps. Just look at his fastball location to right-handed hitters between 22 and 23. Um, what you'll generally see is that he kind of almost had two locations where he was going kind of up away, letting things right arm side, and then he was also kind of pushing inside. And he was kind of all over the place. I, I don't think he has great innate command. So what it seems like to me they did this most recent year was really just give him one target, like put him kind of more up in versus righties and let natural misses go to the outer third of the plate. But we, we don't really care about those. We want you to try to get the ball inside more and then work on that inside line with your slider down to right-handed hitters. And it worked really well from a control standpoint. So I don't necessarily know if simplifying, you know, approaching the zone for every single pitcher is going to improve command, but it clearly did for Justin Steele. He wrote it all year and he dominated. I, I think that fastball is just such a wacky pitch. Like, you know, it's it's a it's a weird offering. It's a cutter. It's not a forcing fastball, in my opinion. He he just is so naturally his wrist position is so naturally supinated at release that he just cuts everything he throws. Like he does kind of have a sinker. He does kind of have a changeup, but he just throws them so sparingly, and they're not great. They're more just like 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 shotgun blast pitches. They're just like a, what was that? You know, I have no idea. But but yeah, the fastball is super odd, especially coming from that arm angle. There's not really any other lefty in base or even pitcher. There might be some righties. There's probably not any lefties in baseball who literally create that much drop and like cut to the pitch it's it's a cutter it's you can't even really classify it as a forcing fastball even if he'll tell you it's a forcing fastball but i think it's sustainable for the most part you know and i think it's, he's a great example of a guy that is overperforming stuff plus and perhaps there's some reason why like stuff plus is looking at pitches that have happened in the past that are similar and because that pitch is so unique we don't really have too good of priors to understand how good that might be going forward because no one's kind of thrown that pitch before. So our sample is really small. If you have a really generic four-seat fastball, like we're pretty confident there's been 10,000 of those, 20,000, 30,000 of them thrown over the last couple of years to be able to tell how that's going to do. But on Steele's four-seam, it's so unique. I just think it's really hard for Stuff Plus to figure out what it's doing and if it's good or not. Um, so it grades out as average, but it's clearly, in my opinion, an above-average pitch for a couple of reasons. That, and again, that goes back to the substack. I love like kind of figuring out like once you understand stuff plus the fun part is then trying to figure out why stuff plus might be wrong on a pitcher that's like the next level right like you look at it as gospel and then you're like ah this guy who's got a league average is not a league average we have two years sample of him overperforming on the contact quality side of things why is that happening and then you try to understand that and then you know make your own uh assessments as to whether it's predictable so that's my take on steel the early adp for justin steel 102.6 as the 28th starting pitcher off the board going just behind zach efflin joe ryan kyle bradish does that range sound right? Do you think Justin Seals should be going higher than that? What do you think? Yeah, that's a tough one. I'd probably take Bradish above him. Maybe that's just my little bias towards Bradish. I had a lot of him last year, and he, he proved to be very, very uh, good for me. Um, I think that's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think I might I think I think might be okay with that. I think that's a reasonable area. I'd probably just flip Bradish above him, but the other names you mentioned, I think he's in that area. I, I, I'm curious to see if his ADP drops. Because I do think he's not going to be too sexy of like a, a data guy because of the stuff plus because of all these other projections that are probably going to undercount how good that four seam is. So I'd be curious to see over time whether he becomes more of a value and he's maybe going slightly later. Or if people actually zig that and go sharp on him and think that he's actually had a pretty good inning total, you know, and he's had really good results. And maybe we rely more on the results than we do some of the underlying stats there. So I, I'm not sure where I'm going to end up taking him, but I'll probably have more shares than I did last year where I really didn't have much because I leaned on the, you know, Sarah stuff of saying that it really wasn't that good of offering. I know, you know, was often too. I agree. Like I, I believe in a lot of that stuff a lot of the time, but I think steel might be an odder case that we're not capturing fully on the under underlying metric side of things. Yeah. You know, I, I think I kind of like Justin Steele so far, just still kind of working out my starting pitcher ranks. I yeah, agree. Same. I mean, Radish, I think is someone I'm going to target. Like if you play in a deeper league, like a 15 team league, if I get him as my SP two, or if you're playing a 12 team or you get Bradish as your three, I, I think you're doing great there. So oh, yeah, I, agree. I think he's the one I would push ahead, but I think I would take Steele ahead of both Zach Eflin and Joe Ryan. Nothing against those guys. Like Zach Eflin, you know, he's only really been able to stay healthy for one season, and that was last year. Yeah. And then like Joe Ryan, I mean, I have all kinds of crazy thoughts about like gives up way too many home runs. And yeah, he's a I worry one. about him being like too one dimensional with the fastball. So uh, I'm, I'm going to push Joe Ryan down personally for me. But let's wrap up with this. Sleeper pitchers. Anyone that yeah. you've noticed that's going late in NFBC ADP uh, could be a Chicago Cubs pitcher, could not be a Chicago Cubs pitcher, uh, but any names that you've noticed stand out and, and maybe ones that you're even going to target in your drafts. Yeah, yeah. I, this is this is the first kind of looking I've done at some of the SP ADP. I haven't really digged in too much. I don't think I have any drafts coming up for a bit. But um, 
the names that jumped out are probably more, maybe not the deep, deep window, but in like the middle rounds or so. I, I like Nick Pavetta a little. And I know anyone that's played fantasy for a long time is like, you got to be kidding me. But I actually really like some of the adjustments that he made last year late. He was like a starter at the beginning of the year, and then he went to relief in the pen. They played around this cutter and his sweeper. So he kind of had one slider, and they broke it into two pitches where they gave him something more lateral and also something that was harder with a little more lift. Um, and I like that adjustment, and it proved really strong when he came back at the end of the year. He kind of dominated in those last couple starts. So, again, like – Projections are going to say we take that entirety of that whole year and we'll project it forward. We don't really think the end adjustments are something that matter. And I, I think for the most part, that's probably a good way to just approach, you know, second half surgers or whatever you want to call them. But I tend to maybe buy into certain guys when I see clear adjustments like this. Now, the question is whether the league will adjust back. I think they will to some extent. And they kind of backed off his splitter, which is kind of funny. We we're just talking about splitters. They backed off his splitter because it was getting killed, actually. I have no idea why. Maybe he was tipping it or something early in the year. But I like him where he is. He dominated. Like, I, I just think that small sample is really good, and we have reason to back up why it was so good. That I kind of like him. He, he ended up as, like, an SP – I think he was, like, SP30-ish or so last year. Um, but I like those small adjustments for him. So I'll go Pavetta. Then I'll go two Rays, guys. Back to back, I think they're going very similar in ADP. Aaron Savali and Ryan Pepio. This might be more just betting on an organization generally, but the Rays for the last couple of years have done a great job of extracting a lot of these value, this value out of guys. I had a lot of Zach Eflin last year. He really helped me out in some leagues. I like him again this year. I'm not sure against Steel. I might actually take Eflin above Steel. That's probably a good debate um, that I just heard you mention. But yeah, I like both those guys. Savali, they played around with adding a sweep or two. They threw more sinker. They kind of diversified his mix a little. I'm curious to see in the offseason if they tweak anything with him. Sometimes in-season adjustments are a little harder to make for a guy switching teams after the deadline. They got him. Pepio is an interesting one because the Dodgers, I think, kind of unlocked some stuff with him last year. And I think the Rays see that. I think they really like the four seam. The changeup's really good. I, In talking to some people in the Dodgers organization, I know that Pepio is a guy who played around with the sweeper. And this gets into a whole layer of, like, maybe everyone shouldn't have a sweeper, which is very much the case. And I think Pepio ran into some trouble actually trying to maintain that sweeper, and it messed up some of his mechanics from what I understand. So he's a guy that I'm very curious on the breaking ball maintenance side of things and what the Rays specifically do with him. And I, I'd actually – if they gave him a sweeper, I might actually back off Pepio, which is maybe a super hot take. But I'm curious to see if they maintain kind of the, what I call like the Dodger slider, which is a little shorter, harder slider, but a lot of guys throw with his fastball shape. So I still like him at the ADP again because I think they extract so much value. And then I'll go super deep, cover my last one quick. Sawyer Gibson Long is going like 500 overall. He's like, I don't know, SP like 98 or something like that right now. Um, he popped last year. He had four starts, 20 innings. This goes back to my point that I mentioned in this podcast. I kind of like what the Tigers are doing on the pitching side. I think he does not have a spot right now. So this feels more like a really, really late draft and hold guy at the moment. And even a guy that's more just you put that eye on him on your waivers and you kind of hold him and see how things transpire in that rotation, especially because they added Maeda. So I'm not exactly sure how many innings he'll throw. I imagine he'll start a triple A and I'd like to monitor how his shapes look and everything looks, but he's a huge extension guy down the mound. That's a really like kind of basic idea that I think a lot of people understand just how far he releasing the ball down the mound. He's in like a really high percentile and he doesn't have the best fastball shape with that extension and how he throws up in the zone allows it to kind of flatten out and work. He's got a nasty slider off it that works really well. I also really like his change up. He's just got a good mix. He generated a lot of swing and miss on some things too. Generally, when you see kind of outside swing and miss results on a righty, I like to think there's a little deception going on. I think it might be linked back to the extension with him. I like him as a pitching prospect. That's also just, again, kind of my hat tip to what the Tigers are doing, I think. So I like Sir Gibson Long as like a super deep guy. Um, again, this is going to have to be like super deep 15 team draft and hold right now. Or for me, he's just a guy that I'm going to keep an eye on on waivers. Um, I also love the NFBC strategy last year in fab leagues of making your entire bench starting pitchers out of the draft. And then just like taking shots. Cause I found, especially in 12 teamers where I think I, I'm a little better than 15 right now. I really like just, I had like Mitch Keller and all these other guys just on my bench on every single one of these 12 teams. And then through like two weeks of the season, I tried to not make a ton of moves. And then I figured out if there was anything that maybe subtly changed and tried to predict going forward, how good these guys would be. So maybe Gibson long, if there's some injuries in the Tigers rotation ends up being one of those guys that I add and sit on my bench for a couple weeks and just see, but I don't think he's going to make the rotation. So he's more of a guy that I think, is going to be super under the radar that I think could be pretty good. Music to my ears, Lance, because I did a draft out at First Pitch Arizona. We went out to watch the Arizona Fall League, like my first draft, way too early back in like first week of November. And I got Aaron Savali, I think it's my SP4. I got Sawyer Gibson Long as like my SP7. So sounds good to me. I've been an Aaron Savali apologist for years. So I, yeah, I, yeah. to me, it just makes 
so much sense with what they did with Zach Eflin having a really good curveball, you know, kind of accentuated that cutter. I, I feel like Savali just fits that mold so much and they can kind of do something similar here in 2024. So yeah, I'm, I'm very big on Savali as well, but thank you so much for joining us here today. Again, you can find him on Twitter X at Lance bras. You can check out his Substack. You can check out his YouTube channel. If you're watching the Chicago Cubs, you could potentially see him uh, out there interviewing some players as well. Lance, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Thanks for having me, Frank. All right, we're going to wrap there. For Lance, I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify, and we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.